And then I met Day in 1951 when he was on his first lecture tour. And then later, even though I had met him in 51, later Charlie Miller introduced me to him like in 1959, somewhere in 58, somewhere in there. And, I, and I've often said, if you were going to meet Dave Vernon, I can't think of a better guy to introduce you to him than Charlie Miller. It meant a lot to me, I can tell you, over a period of time, to say that I was a friend of Charlie Miller's and Dave Vernon and other people. I mean, that was really, I, you know, not everybody could say that. And I, I really appreciated knowing these people and, uh, and learning whatever. And I'll, I often tell people, in those days, when I was in their company, just absorbed. In my old book, in my 1997 book, there's a picture in there of me and Charlie and Day all standing together. And that was a picture taken on the occasion of Day and Charlie both coming to visit me in uh, 1959 over over uh, Memorial Day, and uh, there uh, there are two stories about that visit that I'll tell that are both really something. But one is that he while he was in town for he was there with me for four or five days, and during that period I had him lined up to do a lecture. And uh, on the night of the lecture, we were driving to a downtown hotel where the lecture would be held. My wife, me, and Day and Charlie, all four of us riding along, and Day was telling a story. And I was, it was, it was a long story. You know, it was one, you know, he'd say, and, 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 you know, I didn't realize that he didn't have the gimmick. See, I thought he had it, and I wondered, what is he going to And the story goes on. And then he took out the front, and he had the wand, and I said, what do you do with that? You know, and the story just kept going on like that, seemingly never getting anywhere. And finally, we're driving down a street where there's a grocery store, and he says, pull over, pull over. And I pulled over and parked in front of the grocery store, and he says, here, come with me, and I'll finish the story while we're in here. So Charlie and my wife stay in the car, and Day and I go in the grocery store, and we walk up to the pro fresh produce section, and he starts feeling oranges, and you know, and he's obviously looking for final loads for the cups and balls. Now I I know what his cups and balls are like. They were Paul Fox cups, and I was totally familiar with the size and. They, and you know, and when he picked up something, you know, this big, I know this is going to fit in a Paul Fox cup. And he gets a sack and throws a big, huge orange in the sack, you know, and looking for an apple, he gets it. And I finally, I, and he's still telling the story. And then, I, you know, I thought, boy, I, I got to see this because I've been waiting my whole life to find out what he does when he picks a gimmick. And, then the, and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, uh, but, but we'll finish the story in a minute, but you're picking up fruit here that is too large. You know, you, uh, you're, getting in, you're getting a mess going here, Dave. Uh, 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 no, see, what I wanted to know was how is he going to fit the wand in there so that the whole thing went, you know, and the story kept going on. I, I, I couldn't stop him from picking up the fruit, so I just gave up. And we went back to the car, and all the way from that point to the hotel, I kept thinking, oh, God, when he gets ready to make the loads, he's going to be trying to, it won't work, it's going to be a disaster. And I know his routine, because his routine basically was in a 1939 Sphinx magazine. Uh, not credited to him, but uh, credited to Muhammad Bey but it was basically his routine. And so I knew the routine, and I knew when the loads would come, and I, was, I, I knew that I was going to have to sit there and see the loads take place, or not take place, as the case may be. And so we got down there. Comes time for the first load, and day goes just as zoop. Smooth as silk. And I'm trying to get over that. When he makes the second load, it's smooth as silk. And he, he makes the third load, and you know, all the loads are perfect just another gotcha. <laughs> the other story about that event was that my wife said, now look, 
you guys can have all the fun you want to have, and Harry's taken four or five days off from work, so you know, uh, you know, you can really enjoy magic. That's what you all love. But I insist on one thing: when it comes time to go to bed, you march yourselves up to those bedrooms and you go to bed. You don't stay up till four o'clock and then try to sleep in till three. We're not going to have that. And Day says, "Okay, Marty, we'll, we'll, we'll do that." And so the first night, we've been talking magic all night. It gets to be about midnight, and, Ver and Vernon says. Hey, look, it's time to go to bed. Now, we're not going to string Margie out here. We, so we all get up and walk over. He and Charlie and I walk over to the stairway. And as, as we get to the stairway, Dave's got uh, four aces in his hand. He says, oh, there's something I, I wanted to show you. And he does what later we found out was a trick called twisting the aces. And this is... You know, Charlie had never seen it before, I'd never seen it before, and, and apparently he had only developed this trick in recent months and had only maybe shown it to two or three people in New York, and so we were among the first people to ever see it. And it's a, 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 a magicians, uh, of course, are familiar with it today under that title, Twisting the Aces. And if you can stop and think for a minute that at midnight, you know, you're standing there getting ready to go to bed and somebody does this incredible card trick for you that you can't explain any part of, you know, that was a whopper. And then Day says, uh, I'll talk about it tomorrow or something and gets, goes on upstairs to bed and Charlie and I are standing there looking at each other and I said, what did he do? And Charlie says, I don't know. And, and we, we, we finally, by the end of the period, uh, we got him to talk about it enough that we could put it together ourselves. And so I, I was the possessor of the whole Twisting the Aces trick for like a year before it got out, you know. Everywhere I went, I, I was doing that trick, you know. But that's funny the way he uh, gave it to us. So he, he, he really enjoyed shooting people down like that.